This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and it will be about solving equations like fx is congruent to zero, modulo p, where p is a prime um, modulus. So just as background, um, we, note we, we recall that we've considered equations fx is congruent to zero modulo m for m an arbitrary number, and we first showed that we can reduce the case when m is arbitrary to the case when we're working modulo p to the n using the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, next, we can reduce the case of working mod p to the n to the case of working mod p most of the time using Newton's method or Hensel's lemma. And so the third case is the case where, when, when p is a prime. So um, if we can solve the case when p is a prime, then we can sort of solve the case working modulo any number. And this lecture will be about this case here, and previous lectures were about the, the, the other two cases. Um, so how can we solve modulo p a prime? Well, first of all, there's the stupid method um, where we check x equals 0, 1, 2, up to p minus 1. And this is fine if p is small, less than about 10 if you're doing by hand, or maybe a less than a million or a billion if you're doing it by computer, but it's quite hopeless if p is really large, you know, maybe p is, has 100 digits in it or something, and this would take um, far too long. Um, so we want to find some methods for solving this equation, even when p is, is a really large prime. Well, let's start by looking at some advantages um, of p being prime as opposed to an arbitrary modulus. So the first example is there are no zero divisors. So a zero divisor is something that divides zero but isn't zero. So what this means is that if AB is congruent to zero modulo P, then either A is congruent to zero mod P or B is congruent to zero mod p, which is very useful. We recall that this definitely fails if p is not prime. For instance, 2 times 3 is congruent to 0 mod 6, but 2 is not congruent to 0 mod 6, and 3 is not congruent to 0 mod 6. So, so it's sort of very disconcerting to have a product of two non-zero things that can be 0. Um, the next nice property is that inverses exist at least provided something is not zero. So if A is not congruent to zero mod P, then AB is congruent to one for some number B. And remember, we can find B quite rapidly using Euclid's algorithm or something like that. And of course, inverses obviously don't exist modulo six because two doesn't have an inverse, for example. Um, these two properties are very closely related. In fact, if inverses of non-zero elements exist, this immediately implies there are no zero divisors. Um, another nice property is that polynomials of degree n have at most n roots. You sort of may remember this from high school algebra, and you may think, well, we, we know that all polynomials of degree n have at most n roots, but it's actually not true if you're not working modulo a prime. For example, we just recall that x squared minus 1 mod 8 has four roots, 1, 3, 5, and 7. So polynomial, if you're not working modulo a prime, then usually polynomials of degree n may have an unexpectedly large number of roots, which is, again, rather inconvenient. Next, we've got Fermat's theorem, which says that x to the p is congruent to x mod p. And this is um, you know, one of the absolute basic results in number theory we use all the time. And you may say, well, if we're not working modulo a prime, we've got Euler's theorem, x to the phi of um, m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Um, but this just isn't as easy to use. I mean, We've got to start using Euler's totient function, which is a little bit messy, and you know, being able to raise things to the power of the prime p is so makes things life so much easier. Um, 
And another advantage is primitive roots. So primitive roots exist modulo p. And I'm not going to say anything very much about primitive roots this lecture, but we'll be covering them in a later lecture. And anyway, this is a this is another big advantage of primes that, 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 that we have primitive roots. Um, so let me first say a little bit more about why do polynomials of degree n, if it, but this is a polynomial mod p, has at most n roots, provided p is prime. So in order to understand why we need p to be prime, let's go through the usual proof of this and see why it works for p prime and fails if p is not prime. So suppose we've got a polynomial fx of degree n. And suppose a is a root. This means f of a is equal to zero. Um, now, um, what we do is we take f of x and we divide it by the polynomial x minus a, and we get g of x plus some remainder r. So um, we can always divide a polynomial by some other polynomial of leading coefficient 1, and we get a quotient and a remainder. And now if we put x equals a, we have f of a equals a minus a times g of a plus the remainder. And, and this is zero because a is a root, and this is obviously zero. So r equals zero. So f of x is equal to x minus a times g of x. So whenever a is a root of a polynomial, the polynomial is divisible by x minus a. And now we can try and show that um, f has at most n roots by induction. Well, we know g has um, at most n minus 1 roots, as the degree of g is equal to n minus 1, and we're applying some sort of inductive hypothesis to g. So if b is a root, so if f b equals 0, this implies b minus a times g of b equals 0, which implies b equals a, or b is a root of g. And this is the key point of the proof, because this step here, um, we're using the fact there are no zero divisors, um, modulo p, I guess. Um, so if there are zero divisors, we can't conclude that b must be either a or a root of g. Well, obviously, if b is, is a or a root of g, this immediately implies there are at most n roots of f. So polynomials to the degree n modulo p have at most n roots. And let's just see this, this step actually failing if we're not working modulo a prime. So suppose we take f of x to be x squared minus 1, and we work mod 8, then obviously there's a root which is just 1. So we write x squared minus 1 is equal to x minus 1, x plus 1. But the problem is, um, if, if this is 0, it doesn't imply that one of the two factors is 0. For instance, if we put x equals 3, we get the factor 3 minus 1 times 3 plus 1, and this is not congruent to 0, and this is not congruent to 0, mod 8, of course, but this product is congruent to 0, mod 8. So we found a new root of x squared minus 1 that isn't a root of either of its factors. Um, so um, let's have a look at uh, a particularly important polynomial and look at its roots. So let's take the polynomial x to the p minus x. And we know its roots by Fermat. So the roots are just 0, 1, 2, op 2, p minus 1, um, mod p. Of course, anything else is a root, but um, these are the p distinct roots modulo p. So um, as before, we can take this polynomial and divide it by x minus a root, and we see that it's divisible by x times x minus 1 times x minus 2, all the way up to times x minus p minus 1, because these are all distinct roots. And now we notice that these polynomials have the same degree and the same leading term, so they must actually be the same, and we find x to the p minus x is congruent to this 
modulo p. And now we can get some nice identities by just expanding this out. Um, um, so let, let, let's first do a few explicit examples. So um, 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 we, 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 we have x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 is equal to x cubed minus 3x plus 2x. So this is for p equals 3. I guess I should do the case p equals 2 if x x minus 1 equals x squared minus x. So this is for p equals 2. For p equals 5, we have x, x minus 1, x minus 2, x minus 3, x minus 4 um, um, is equal to x to the 5 minus 10x plus 35, 10x to the 4 plus 35x cubed minus 50x squared plus 24x. And we notice that a lot of the coefficients are divisible by p. So this coefficient is divisible by 3. These coefficients are all divisible by 5. And if we go on like this, let's let's do the one more case, x, x minus 1, all the way up to x minus 6. And this is equal to x to the 7 minus 21 x to the 6 plus 175 x to the 5 minus 735 x to the 4 plus 1624 x cubed minus 176 x squared plus 720 x. And again, if you're really good at mental arithmetic, we'll have noticed that all these numbers are divisible by, by 7. And these two aren't, of course, because those are the ones that are the x to the 7 minus x. Um, and how do we calculate these coefficients? Well, um, um, if we expand this out, we see all these coefficients come by adding up various products of the numbers um, here. So, for example, this 10 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And I guess I should have a plus 0. Um, this number 35, um, we get by adding up all products of pairs. So 0 times 1 plus 0 times 2 and so on. Actually, these 0 times something are a bit silly. And we get plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 3 plus 1 times 4 plus 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4 plus 3 times 4. Um, and the 50 is going to come from... Um, I'll miss out the ones with a 0 and I'm getting bored of them. So we get 1 times 2 times 3 plus um, 1 times 2 times 4 plus 1 times 3 times 4 plus 2 times 3 times 4. And so on. Um, so if we um, multiply this out explicitly, we see we get x times x minus 1 all the way up to x minus p minus 1 is equal to x to the p minus sigma 1 x to the p minus 1 plus sigma 2 x to the p minus 2 minus sigma 3 x to the p minus 3 all the way up to plus or minus sigma to the... Um, um, p minus 1 x uh, plus 0 because the sigma p is 0 where, 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 where sigma p is the sum of all all the products of so sigma i is the sum of all products of i of these so for example sigma 1 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 so I should have a plus 0 and sigma 2 is equal to 0 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus plus 1 times 2 and so on and sigma 3 is all um, sums of 1 times 2 times 3 plus 1 times 2 times 4 and so on. And we get all the way up to sigma p minus 1 is just 1 times 2 all the way up to times p minus 1 plus 0 times various factors, which is a bit stupid to write out. So in fact, sigma p minus 1 is just p minus 1 factorial. Um, well, um, all of these things... I'll just congruent to 0 mod p by what we said earlier. Um, this one must be congruent to minus 1 mod p because it's the coefficient of x in x to p minus x, at least if x is odd. If, if x is even, this is actually also true, but you have to sort of think slightly more about it. So we, in fact, get another proof of Wilson's theorem that p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 
mod P. So this is just Wilson's theorem all over again. So you can think of all these others as being a sort of variation of Wilson's theorem, except we've got some slightly more complicated sums and they're all congruent to zero. So we can give an application of this to um, something called um, Bolston Holmes theorem. Actually, there are several slightly different theorems called Wollstone Holmes theorem. So I'll, I'll first do the easy, a sort of easy and fact rather trivial case of it, and then have a slightly more interesting one. So this is the one where you look at the denominator of one plus a half plus a third, all the way up to plus one over p minus one. And Wollstone's Holmes theorem says that the numerator is divisible by p. Well. We should start off by checking this for a few small values of p. So let's try p equals 2. And this sum is 1 over 1 plus, oops, well, this is just 1. And the numerator of this is certainly not divisible by p. It's odd, not even. So, so Wollstone's Holm theorem seems to be wrong in the most um, silly possible way. Well, um, that's because I missed out a condition. It's divisible by p if p is greater than 2. This looks like a rather stupid condition. It looks as if I just sort of randomly added the, the simplest possible condition I can think of to avoid the obvious counterexample. Well, let's check it for a few other cases just to make sure I haven't forgotten any other conditions. So for p equals 3, we get 1 plus a half, which is 3 over 2. For p equals 5, we add up 1 plus a half plus a third plus a quarter, which is 25 over 12. For p equals 7, we get 49 over 20, and for p equals 11, uh, we get 7381 over 2520, and so on. And you notice this is divisible by 3, by 5, by 7, and if you think for a moment, you can see this is divisible by 11, unless I've made a stupid mistake. So, so this theorem does seem to be OK, and now let's see why it's true. Well, that, that follows easily because if we take 1 plus a half plus a third plus 1 over p minus 1, we can expand this out. It's 1 times 2 times 3 times p minus 1 um, on the bottom. And then on the top, we've got 1 times 2 times all the way up to um, p minus 2 plus 1 um, times 2 all the way up to p minus 1. 3 times p minus 1 and so on, plus all the way up to 2 times all p minus 1. So we've got all the sums of p minus 2 of these. So, so this is sigma p minus 2, and this is sigma p minus 1. And we know that sigma p minus 2 is congruent to 0 mod p if p is greater than 2. Because if p equals 2, this is the sum of the zeroth, this... This, this doesn't work. Um, um, incidentally, that there's another um, somewhat easier way of proving this. What we do is we look at all these fractions modulo p, and we see that the, the, the numbers 1, a half, up to 1 over p minus 1 are all non-zero numbers modulo p. Um, because if you take all the numbers, non-zero numbers modulo p, and then take all their inverses, you've again got all the numbers modulo p. So, so these are all congruent to 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1 in some order. I don't mean a half is congruent to 2 and a third is congruent to 3. That would be kind of stupid. What I mean is a half is congruent to one of these numbers and a third is congruent to another one of them. So 1 plus a half plus all the way up to plus 1 over p minus 1 is congruent to 1 plus 2 plus plus p minus 1, which is equal to p times p minus 1 over 2. And this is divisible by p if p is not equal to 2, because if p is equal to 2, this factor of 2 on the bottom cancels out p. So that gives a second proof of the easy version of um, Volston's Holmes theorem. Um, next, um, um, if we go back and look at our calculations, what we notice is that we've actually got something a bit better because we notice that this thing here 
is actually divisible by 5 squared, and this thing is divisible by 7 squared, and think about it a bit, this is divisible by 11 squared. So the numerator is not just divisible by p, it's actually divisible by p squared. And this gives us the a sort of better version of Molston Holmes' theorem. The numerator of 1 plus a half plus, plus 1 over p minus 1 is divisible by p squared. Well, of course, it's um, it, it, enough to show that the numerator, in, instead of doing the numerator being divisible by p squared, um, we can um, um, all we need to do is to show that sigma p minus 2 is divisible by p squared because um, the numerator is this times something coprime to p. So let's go back to our polynomial f of x, which is x minus 1 up to all the way up to x minus p minus 1. Um, and we're going to put x equals p, and we get this is um, f of p is equal to p minus 1 times p minus 2 down to 1, which is p minus 1 factorial. Um, um, on the other hand, it's also equal to p to the p minus 1 minus sigma 1 p to the p minus 2 all the way down to plus sigma p minus 3 times p squared minus sigma p minus 2 times p. Um, plus sigma p minus 1. And now we notice that sigma p minus 1 is just equal to this term here, p minus 1 factorial. So all this bit here is equal to 0. And now we notice that this bit here, everything except the last two terms, is divisible by at least p cubed, um, because we've always got p to the 3 or something there. So we find that sigma to the p minus 3 um, p squared minus sigma to p minus 2p is divisible by p cubed. So this just means that sigma to the p minus 2 is congruent to p times sigma to p minus 3 modulo p squared. Um, well, sigma p minus 3 is going to be 0 mod p if p is greater than 3 because all these, all these sigmas were 0 unless the subscript was 0. But if p is 3, that, then, then this is sigma 0, which, which is not divisible by p. So um, this gives us sigma p minus 2 is congruent to 0 modulo p squared if p is greater than 3, which is um, um, what we are trying to show. It shows the denominator is divisible by p squared. Um, so uh, now uh, that, that we've looked at the polynomial x to the p minus 1 minus 1 in some detail, let, let, let's look at the following general problem. Given um, a solution fx is congruent to 0 mod p, we have the following problems. Um, does it have solutions? So, for instance, instance, we might ask, does x squared is congruent to minus 1 mod p have any solutions? Are there square roots of minus 1? In this particular case, we saw that was true if p is congruent to 2 or 1 mod 4. Um, secondly, we can ask how many. And thirdly, we might want to find them. Um, so these are increasingly difficult problems. And what I want to do is to, is to um, start on showing how to solve these reasonably fast. Of course, all of these problems are easy to solve just by trial and error, provided p is small. The, 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 the real problem is try and solve them when p is too large to, to just check every possible case. Well, there's one neat way to find the number of solutions. Let's take the greatest common divisor of f of x 
and x to the p um, minus x. So you remember this is x times x minus 1 times x minus p minus 1. So the greatest common divisor will just be the product of x minus a, where f of a is equal to 0. So, um, you know, the, the greatest common divisor will just be the linear factors of x to the p minus x that divide f of x. So we can find the number of distinct solutions is the, just the degree of this. So, so how many solutions, the number of distinct solutions is just going to be the degree of the greatest common divisor of f and x to the p minus x. So that's rather neat because we can find out how many solutions there are without actually finding them all. So let's let's um, just do a rather trivial example. So let's do the number of solutions of x cubed minus x squared plus x minus 1 mod 3. And of course mod 3 it would be faster just to check 0, 1 and 2 to see if they're solutions. But I want to show this um, more uh, an example of this more general method. Well we just take the greatest common divisor with x cubed minus x. So, so we have x cubed minus x is equal to 1 times x cubed minus x squared plus x minus 1 um, plus x squared plus x plus 1. So we're using Euclid's method. So we take this polynomial, divide it by that, and take the remainder, which is x squared plus x plus 1. Then we take this polynomial, x cubed minus x plus x squared minus minus x squared plus x minus 1, sorry, um, and we divide it by x squared plus x plus 1, and we get x plus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1, and we have a remainder, which is minus x minus 1, and then we take this x squared plus x plus 1, and we write it as um, x minus 1 times x minus 1 and now there's no remainder so we're finished and the greatest common divisor is x minus 1 and now we notice the degree is equal to 1 so there is one root notice this won't detect multiple roots um, um, if a polynomial has uh, has has the root 1 three times that will still only count as one root because because um, x to the p minus x only has, has single roots. Um, well, at first sight, um, this seems to give a neat method of finding the number of solutions. At second sight, you suddenly realize it seems to be useless. Um, because um, ha ha the time taken to find the greatest common divisor of two polynomials f and g is something to do with the degree of f plus the degree of g number of steps because um, each time you divide a polynomial by another you're going to reduce the degree by one unless you're really lucky so um, and the problem here is that the degree of x to the p minus x is p which might be huge so if p has 100 digits, you don't seem to, I mean, taking the greatest common divisor of x to the p minus x is going to take about 10 to the 100 steps. And this is no better than just finding the roots one by one. Fortunately, there's a cunning method of speeding things up. So we want to speed up finding the greatest common divisor of x to the p minus x and f of x. And how can we do this? Well, the key point um, although the degree is huge, this is a sparse polynomial that most coefficients are zero. In fact, all but two of them are zero. And if one of the polynomials is sparse, then you can um, enormously speed up finding the greatest common divisor. Uh, actually, this one is sparse and this one has small degree. And if one polynomial has small degree and the other is sparse, we can speed up the greatest common divisor by using the Russian peasant method. 
Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, the key point is we want to work out, we want to find x to the p modulo f of x. Um, and then once we found x to the p, it's easier to subtract x. So the key point is we want to work out this exponent. And now we can just use the Russian peasant method to find an x to the p. So we write, write p in binary. And we calculate x, x squared, x to the 4, x to the 8, and so on, modulo um, f of x. And at each step, we should, of course, remember to reduce the polynomial modulo f of x so these powers don't get too big. And we should also reduce modulo p um, um, in, in order that the coefficients don't get too big. And once we've done that, we can actually calculate x to the p modulo f of x actually rather fast. So, so although at first sight this method seems to be rather slow, there's this cunning method of speeding it up. So we really can find the number of roots of a polynomial um, quite fast without actually finding the roots. Um, by the way, I should say that um, by extending these ideas, you can not just find the number of roots of a polynomial, but you can actually find the roots explicitly. And more generally, we can actually factor the polynomial into irreducible factors. Um, I might say something more about this in a later lecture. Um, in the meantime, we're just going to use this simple idea for um, finding the number of roots. So let's do an example. Suppose we take f of x to be x squared minus a. So we can ask when is a a square modulo p. And um, we can just look at the greatest common divisor of x squared minus a and x to the p minus x. So to do this, we take x to the p minus x and we divide it by x minus a. And this isn't actually very difficult to do. Um, Let's write this as x to the p minus 1 minus 1, so I don't have to worry about x equals 0, which is annoying. So we have x to the p minus 1 minus 1 is equal to x squared minus a. And then if we divide it, we get x to the p minus 3 plus a x to the p minus 5 plus a squared x to the p minus 7. So all the way down to plus um, a to the p minus 3 over 2. And then we get a remainder is a to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1. So this is the, this is the remainder. Here I'm taking, uh, uh, I should have said I'm taking p odd, because if p is even, something always goes wrong. Not, not like you couldn't divide p minus 1 by 2. And so we see that the greatest common divisor is going to be... Um, um, given like um, this, um, if a to the p minus 1 minus 1 is not 0. So if a to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 is not 0 mod p, um, it means there's, there's no root. And if a to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 is congruent to 0, there's a root. Well, a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to plus or minus 1 because its square is um, 1 by Fermat's theorem. So we have the following neat result, which is originally due to Euler. a to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to plus 1 if a is square modulo p and minus 1 if a is not square. So this gives us a fast method to check if a is square mod p. All we have to do is to calculate this, which we can do um, using the Russian peasant method of exponentiating, and we just see whether it's 1 or minus 1. Actually, this is um, a rather bad fast method. Um, so I'll, I'll just say 
later on we're going to replace by a faster method using um, something called the Jacobi or Jacobi symbol. So don't actually use this method to check whether A is a square or not. It's, although it's fast, it's, it's the, 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 there is a much better method coming up in a few lectures. Um, so let's have another example. Um, if D divides P minus 1, then X to D minus 1 congruent to 0 mod P has exactly the roots. And we can see this by noting that x to the p minus 1 minus 1 is divisible by x to the d minus 1 if d divides p minus 1. This is, this is just because y to the n minus 1 is divisible by y. Here we take y equals x to the d and n is equal to p minus 1 over d. So um, that means the greatest common divisor of x to the p minus 1 minus 1 and x to the d minus 1 is just x to the d minus 1. So um, um, all so, 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 which has degree d so there must be exactly d roots of it. Um, we can take a look at this. Um, let's take a look at cubes modulo 7 and modulo 11. So modulo 11, all numbers um, are cubes. So that x cubed congruent to 1 has only one solution um, because um, there can't be any other number of order 3 because 3 doesn't divide 11 minus 1. But modulo 7, um, if we look at the numbers modulo 7, there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So these two are cubes. And we notice that 1, one cubed equals 2 cubed equals 4 cubed equals 1. And um, 3 cubed equals 5 cubed equals 6 cubed equals 6. So um, 3 is dividing 7 minus 1, so there are 3 cubes of 1, and uh, in fact 3 cubes of all the other numbers. So the number of, number of cubes of um, 1 modulo some prime depends on whether p minus 1 is divisible by 3 or not. Um, um, OK, um, next lecture will be another theorem about um, solving equations modulo p called the Chevalet warning theorem, where we will show an equation always has roots modulo p provided it has enough variables.